Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's lecture. A couple of short announcements before we get started. Um, starting at 5.30, we'll be going on a walk through Abbo's Alley. We'll meet right outside of Gary to walk. It is a peaceful stroll. You're not going to be scaling any rocks or anything you might have encountered on morning hikes. Um, it's pretty shaded. It's lovely. It's like a hidden pathway through campus that it seems insane that all of it is like 10 feet away from where we are eating meals and stuff. Um, so would recommend it if you want a little bit of the outdoors. Um, and then the last thing tomorrow, we have another open mic. Sign up sheet will be on the mail table in the inn starting at breakfast until the slots are filled. And then that will take place out here tomorrow night. Um, those are all of the, Leah. Thank you, Leah, and I will ask up Alexander Chi. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out for this. Um, I was just remembering this very funny photo of me, Randall, and Terry Jones at Breadloaf, where I'm wearing, of all things, a Revenge of the Sith t-shirt <laughs> that I'd cut the sleeves off of. Um, and, And it was funny to just think about like how I've come to meet this person who I knew in various different ways over the years through his work after his death. Um, I was talking to someone about the essays that are about to come out who had also read them and I can't remember who it was, someone here who said that to her they were like a love letter. Um, and I w I've been thinking about that a lot in terms of how so much of his nonfiction in particular feels like it is made out of this great uh, caring on his part. Even for the ridiculous, like a Revenge of the Sith muscle shirt. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to begin with a quote from uh, his introduction to the cross of redemption, the uncollected James Baldwin. This was his, Randall's introduction. Imagine, it is 1947, late autumn. You are 23 years old. You are black. You are living in New York's Greenwich Village. You work at a small Caribbean restaurant on McDougal Street called Calypso. 
You wait tables. You have worked laying railroad tracks in New Jersey. You hated the job. You hate segregated life and the indignities to which you were subjected on top of your hard scrabble existence. You cannot afford to go to college. You must earn money to send home to your large impoverished family up in Harlem and to survive. People say you look about 15 years old. You have interesting friends, paramount among them, being the African-American painter Beaufort Delaney, worldly and wise. He takes a special interest in you. He is your mentor, a surrogate father. Your father died in 1943. You will later write of Delaney, he opened the unusual door for you. Delaney introduces you to the writer Henry Miller. At the restaurant, you meet Paul Robeson and Burt Lancaster and Eartha Kitt and C.L.R. James and so many others. You become good friends with a young, weird, wild, beautiful Midwesterner enthralled by the possibilities of method acting. His name is Marlon Brando. He is not your lover, but he will remain a lifelong friend. In this exciting Manhattan village, you meet a lot of politically noisy, rambunctious, revolutionary, bohemian, fun-loving types, people who follow socialist ideals, Trotsky and the like, but also you meet musicians, singers, theater people of all stripes, public intellectuals, writers, and editors at places like The Nation, The Partisan Review, The New Leader, Commentary, people like Randall Jarrell and Philip Robb. You get a job as a messenger for a left-leaning newspaper, PM. The editor of The New Leader, Saul Levitas, takes a liking to you. He knows you've been working on a novel, Crying Holy. No, you've changed the name to In My Father's House by now. Levitas suggests you try your hand at writing book reviews. It will give you discipline, he says. Your first review of a collection of short stories by the Russian writer Maxim Gorky is published in the April 12, 1947 issue of The Nation. You write that Gorky is, quote, far from a careful writer and by no means a great one. He is almost always painfully verbose and frequently threatens to degenerate into simple propaganda. The review is somewhat brutal, yet you go on to praise Gorky for his, quote, rare sympathy for people, and further you chastise present-day realistic novelists for their lack of sympathy, for failing to see, quote, the unpredictability and the occasional and amazing splendor of the human being. You end your first review, which has a somewhat sermonic tone on the word salvation. Imagine, at 23, so much of the James Baldwin the world has come to admire and heed and laud and consider as indispensable was already well formed. I suppose I had the idea for this talk after reading and rereading the introduction Keenan wrote for his anthology of James Baldwin's uncollected essays, The Cross of Redemption, which now mirrors a little bit the collection that will appear next month of Keenan's own essays. In three short paragraphs in the declarative second person, Keenan reintroduced me to a writer I thought I knew well, showing me I didn't really know him at all. The attention to detail alone gives us a sense of an omniscient narrator, but of course, Keenan was simply a consummate researcher. The level of research he did, for example, for Walking on Water, his unforgettable reported volume of Black Life in America, created out of thousands of hours of interviews, was to his mind something he might only do justice to if he continued his interviews for a few more decades. How did he do what he did in those paragraphs, I wondered, a little flat-footed after reading it. Obviously, it took a great deal of biographical research, which he had undertaken to write a short biography of Baldwin for the Chelsea House series of biographies for younger readers aimed at students ninth grade and up. The School Library Journal review of it faults it for being, quote, a dense narrative that may daunt some readers, <laughs> which strikes me as a laughable assertion given the loving and lucid care evident in the book itself. The review is faulting him for what he was so evidently. What was his strength as a writer that he knew of what he spoke, or at least 
He tried with every ounce of himself. To get back to the paragraphs, though, he begins by setting us down behind Baldwin's eyes for a moment as if we are in the science fiction novels that Keenan himself loved and always hoped he could write. It is just for a second. We see Baldwin not as Baldwin saw himself. We see him as Baldwin perhaps knew himself but would not describe himself. It is so interesting to me to see how a writer can write about their lives, someone like Baldwin, in what seems like extraordinary detail and yet still be made new to us in this way Keenan does here. And so it is as, it is as if he has split open a moment in time, as well as a place. That first word, a command, imagine, imagine indeed. The immediacy, the immediacy with which that essay begins strikes me as one of Keenan's hallmarks. He was, shall we say, a teleporter when it came to how he began things. He drops you in. There is no confusion about where you are you emerge into a time and a place at the same time as if briefly frozen there, as he extends to you the nature of where you are and what you are seeing and even who you are, either as the reader or in the role he's cast for you in the drama that is about to unfold, which is really the same thing. In his forthcoming essay collection, we see this pattern in many of the essays. He brings you not just into the moment, but the moment's roots and the moment's future as well. In that first paragraph of the Baldwin essay collection introduction, he points to the past to which you were subjected and to the future you will write of Delaney. You start the paragraph imagining yourself as James Baldwin, a young waiter in Greenwich Village, and you end as James Baldwin, the celebrated writer, lifelong friend to Marlon Brando, who was not your lover. What you have here is really an interdimensional portrait of Baldwin, painted with time, the fourth dimension. It is not magic, it is research, a keen eye for detail, and an understanding of something called the chronotope, the intersection of time and place as we experience it in narrative. This word comes to us in literary criticism from the Russian critic Mikhail Bakhtin and his essay, Forms of Time in the Chronotope in the Novel, published in 1937, 10 years before James Baldwin became that waiter in Greenwich Village and when his father was still alive, and Baldwin was, shall we say, still a young boy in Harlem, Bakhtin sought to introduce the term as a literary term this way. We will give the name chronotope, literally time-space, to the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships that are artistically expressed in literature. This term, space-time, is employed in mathematics and was introduced as part of Einstein's theory of relativity. The special meaning it has in relativity theory is not important for our purposes. We are borrowing it for literary criticism almost as a metaphor, almost, but not entirely, what counts for us is the fact that it expresses the inseparability of space and time, time as the fourth dimension of space. We understand the chronotope as a formally constitutive category of literature. We will not deal with the chronotope in other areas of culture. In the literary artistic chronotope, spatial and temporal indicators are fused into one carefully thought out concrete whole. Time, as it were, thickens, takes on flesh, becomes artistically visible. Likewise, space becomes charged and responsive to the movements of time, plot, and history. This intersection of axes and this fusion of indicators characterizes the artistic chronotope. Reading this, I remember thinking that it made sense of something my friend and teacher, Deborah Eisenberg, had said to me a very long time ago about an aesthetic ideal she had for her stories. She said, I want to feel 
like I'm giving somebody a block of wood <laughs> and something real that they can hold and look at. Uh, and she went on to say in another, uh, in an interview in Baum, that it was, she was pursuing something like a sculpture, something that she could walk around and whose features would not uh, alter. I think of this because I think in the works of Randall Keenan in his fiction and his nonfiction, we see someone who, you, who knew how to use language to create something that was like a sculpture in the air around his subjects or that was made out of his subjects as well as from the history of what he knew about them and what he knew about their future as well. And that this was in many ways the peculiar charge his works so often carried. A feeling of immediacy presides as well as an illusion that you are seeing the subject as an angel might or a god, someone who has access to that character's book of fate. And so Baldwin, his father, sorry, his grandfather, his grandmother, whatever the subject, appears to you within a compression of details drawn from the different eras of their lives so that you can experience just for a moment the miracle each of them was and is. In writing, the ways that we talk about time are a little impoverished given how much it affects us all. When the writer introduces the past of a subject to the reader, we have some familiar names for it. Backstory, if long. The flashback, if short. If the past of a subject is the introduction to a piece of writing, we call it exposition, a summary of a large period of time that is turned into a paragraph, two paragraphs, three, five, etc. If the future is introduced, it is a prolepsis, also sometimes called a flash forward. A detail from the future is introduced to create narrative tension with the present. It is different from what we know as a subjunctive mood and that the subjunctive is used to express desire or possibility. The prolepsis instead introduces the future as a fact, as a realist mood, as a linguist or narratologist might say. And so the chronotope, especially in the way Keenan uses it, I think of as a hybrid of states magnetized by the mind of the narrator. I think it introduces us to the world as many of us know it as well. The density of the narrative that the school library journal complains of in Keenan's Baldwin biography is drawn from how there is so much Keenan didn't want to leave out. I don't know how to tell you about myself without telling you about my family, a student of mine said the other day, and I feel as if she was speaking of Keenan. Both of them, it should be said, are from North Carolina. Consider the way he opens an essay from his forthcoming collection, Scuppernongs and Beef Fat, Some Things About the Women Who Raised Me. I forget the exact cause for the occasion, but I remember it was a Saturday night in the 1970s. I remember we were at the Camp Lejeune Marine Base in Jacksonville, North Carolina, where she worked as a cook. She being Clementine Whitley, one of those women who raised me. Saturday nights in those waning days of the Carter administration were marked by too much television viewing for me, TV of the mildest, most innocuous sort. Hee Haw, The Lawrence Welk Show, The Love Boat, Fantasy Island. Sundays were even more boring than Saturdays, which at least held a mythical promise of some type of weekend thrill. Something could happen. These imaginary joys never materialized out in the deep woods and swamps of eastern North Carolina, despite my cousin's intense anticipation of such. Imagine a party of sorts, down on a military base, with lots of food, some dancing. Perhaps it was Independence Day. Perhaps it was some military promotion celebration. It could even have been a wedding reception. I do not now remember the reason for the gathering. 
Without a doubt, I was the youngest person there. By most standards then or now, this was a rather ordinary affair. The enlisted men with their dates, rhythm and blues and soul music playing, socializing of the loud and backslapping type, which to the eyes and ears of a 14 year old country boy is as attractive as the prospect of oral surgery. And there was the food, which to me was the most special part of the occasion. And though the fare was rather ordinary, fried chicken, potato salad, slaw, hush puppies. I remember having recently been introduced to the grown up and somewhat decadent charm of grilled beef. We are speaking specifically of the sirloin and the ribeye and the mischievous T-bone, something in which a boy can delight considering its direct and gruesome anatomy lesson <laughs> as well as delectability. T-bone steaks were fun and still are fun to eat. Those hardy and fun-loving Marines spared no expense when it came to food and selected the most capable and gregarious cook they knew to helm the event, that being my Aunt Clem. My being her sidekick in the kitchen meant I could eat my belly full, that is to say, steak galore. I was not exactly a glutton, but the fact is 14-year-old boys exist for a very few things on this planet and eating is very near the top <laughs> of that brief list. Curiously, at the same time, I had somehow come into the trance of eating right, probably by public service messages interjected in and around Saturday morning cartoons or school nutritionists visiting classes. However, it came to me, I had digested the notion that animal fat was bad. While chomping down on a juicy steak cooked by Aunt Clem, I sliced off the fat and pushed it aside with some contemptuous comment about how eating fat wasn't good for us, delivered with all the sagacity of a self-righteous, greedy 14-year-old. To which she replied by picking it up and popping it in her mouth, saying, you don't eat it because it's good for you. We eat it because it's good. <laughs> Family lore has that I spent my first night in my ancestral home of Chincapin, North Carolina, in Clementine Whitley's house, located on a bend of the Northeast Cape Fear River. Clem Clementine was one of my great aunt Mary's best friends, and in truth, my cousin. Clem was descended from a very large family. Her mother, Viola, was at the time one of Chincapin's oldest matriarchs. The family originated from and lived in what local people referred to as the quarters, for upon the land where her home sat was where the enslaved people of the long gone Chincapin plantation lived. Miss Viola had many children, so Clem had a vast arena of brothers and nephews and nieces and cousins galore. This was exactly the web of family into which I was born. For indeed, I was related to both Clementine by her mother and her husband John, or Chicken, by his mother. Chicken drove a bus. Clem worked down on the Marine base in Jacksonville. By the time of my birth, Clementine Whitley had grown small town famous as an outstanding cook. Women who themselves were not slackers in the kitchen held her food in high esteem. My connection to her was a powerful thing. It was into this world of taste and hard-headed common sense that I became conscious of the world. Thus did Randall Keenan bring us into a lesson learned on a Saturday night in the 1970s in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Nothing about that section feels like it contains what we might call modernist tricks. It just feels like a storyteller, a gifted storyteller, taking his time to tell us about someone who loved him and someone he loved. But consider then the first detail. I forget the exact cause for the occasion, he begins. I remember it was a Saturday night in the 1970s. After first disavowing his expertise, or the clarity of his memory, he then builds detail by de detail. It is a rhetorical strategy of a kind. Don't ask me to tell you which night, he's saying. It doesn't matter, even though it does because of the incident to which he's building. A very short moment in time, an instant really, in the kitchen when he as a 14 year old boy tried to tell his Aunt Clem he wasn't going to eat some of the fat on the steak she'd prepared for him. And so she ate it, 
And she told him why we, and she doesn't say I, she says we, eat it. She's introducing him to a rule of a kind, an ethos of pleasure. Is she his real aunt? Not quite. And yet she is something more important than that, perhaps. He doesn't yet tell us her age, but we can guess she is anywhere from 15 to 50 years older than he is at that moment. He instead has sketched out the world he had then at age 14 and the world view. And inside of that, knowing the specific age of an adult was beyond his awareness. He takes us into the kinds of Saturdays and even Sundays he had back then. He takes us into the TV shows he watched and the other kinds of food he ate. He puts us into that landscape of the town he will go home to once they leave the base together that night, the town they came from earlier in the day. He creates a long tunnel of detail that leads exactly to the moment in question, which we travel across gladly, enjoying the way he lingers on all of those details. He doesn't say that this is how he keeps what he loves safe from oblivion, but we can tell that it is. All this will stay alive on these pages as long as these pages remain. And after the moment is over, he gives us more about the family and the town because that is the destination in this writing just past the limit of the moment. The part of town where the enslaved people of the long gone Chincapin plantation lived, quote unquote. He includes it as the frame for their lives and the joy his aunt Clem takes in this lesson she gives him, the we and we eat it. So often when we speak of time in a memoir, we are talking about a structure, which is to say, we're talking about a timeline, we're talking about something that is created for the reader to move from here to here. In Keenan's essays, he organizes time differently around the subject. And so what we experience is not so much a set timeline in most of his essays, as much as it is this interdimensional experience of them, which is sometimes created around a specific event, but is sometimes created around who they are, who they were, and who they would become. I'm going to read one more short excerpt. I know this is a little indulgent, but <laughs> it's my craft dog. <laughs> uh, this is from the essay Sorrow Songs, which is in uh, his previous anthology, The Fire This Time. Anthology of essays, that is. And this is the beginning. In Memphis, Tennessee, on December 3rd, 1999, Crystal, age 30, died. For the next 33 days, her nine-year-old son, Travis, lived alone with his mother's body. He covered her body with a coat and a notebook paper. He fed himself canned soup and breakfast cereals and frozen pizza. When he had no more food, he went through the apartment, finding whatever money he could and walked himself to buy groceries. He went to school every day, not missing a one, dressing himself, riding the school bus, doing his homework on time. He cut his own hair. He signed his mother's name when he needed to. When a friend came by with her husband to check on them, for she could not raise anyone on the phone, Travis met them at the door. He is reported as having said, Mama can't talk anymore because she got really sick and I think she is dead. The prospect of going to a foster home had terrified him. Later, it would be discovered that his mother suffered from a fist-sized non-cancerous tumor in her lung. For most of the winter of 2000, the story captured the heart of West Tennessee and much of the nation. People gave money and support. Though it doesn't really matter to point it out, Crystal and Travis were African-American. This is one of the saddest, most existential stories I had ever heard. But what does one do with such a tale? 
My response was to write a short story about it. Perhaps the impulse sounds a bit cold at first blush, but I wanted to turn this tragic and bizarre narrative into a short story. For me, stories are able to make sense when little else can, not so much in terms of teasing out morals or rigidly defining that which is so elusive and frightening and senseless in the world, but by allowing us to slip into another's soul for a short period to perhaps comprehend that which is them, to glimpse their experience for a brief while. But for reasons I could not grasp, the fictional demon eluded me. Perhaps such stories cannot be altered and cannot be must with. Perhaps their truth remains somehow inviolate. Reality's darkness sometimes defies recasting, and yet the story continues to move me, to reach me. It is the power of the narrative itself, the emotional force, just like the power of the most straightforward gospel or the rawest blues lament. Perhaps when all is said and done, the story will be best expressed as a sorrow song. And here he quotes, through all the sorrow of the sour songs, there breathes a hope, a faith in the ultimate justice of things. The minor cadences of despair change often to triumph and calm confidence. Sometimes it is faith in life, sometimes a faith in death, sometimes assurance of boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear. But sometimes, somewhere, men will judge men by their souls and not by their skins. Is such a hope justified? Do the sorrow songs sing true? It's from W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. Now, in that short opening to this essay, we first move into the time of the story of the boy and his mother. We then emerge from those first two paragraphs into the winter of 2000. And then we emerge into the personal story time of the writer, of Randall Keenan, deciding that he wanted to write a short story about this and the brief period during which he tried and then failed and decided instead to contemplate this other form of writing, the sorrow song. It's different because this is not, strictly speaking, a memoir uh, and is instead what we might think of as a research personal narrative. He's writing about his own writing process. He's writing about how these kinds of stories come to be whether or not they can be taken up, whether or not they can belong to anyone besides the people they happen to, and why that might be the case. I mention this because I think what we experience in that opening is again a texture of time. The time as, it first, as the story first appeared and these other uh, sets of time that he introduces as a way of understanding how the story changes in his mind and thus how it changes in our own. He says of Du Bois, for one of our greatest native born geniuses, he was as right on the point of the color line as he was about anything. Some could say he was hedging his bets, fearing that his all-consuming topic could not be easily solved. Yet when you consider the changes he had seen, born in 1868, just after the Civil War, witnessed to slaves becoming members of the United States House and Senate, freedmen beginning with nothing and transforming themselves into substantial landowners, slave boys becoming great scientists, dark women once shackled but now leading the crusade for suffrage. When you consider how much of the 20th century was still to come in 1903, it is not difficult to see how much of a prophet Du Bois truly was. And so we go from the far past into the future in a paragraph. In any case, I hope this has complicated your sense of time and narrative 
and that it has drawn you to the work of Randall Keenan, who is Miss Grantly. Thank you so much. <laughs>